worshiping you. We're worshiping with you this morning. And uh, I was thinking as we were singing, what a joy it is to be with God's people, whether they're at the Baptist Church in Windsor or the Bible Church in Santa Rosa, because one day we're all going to be in heaven together. The labels are all gone, and we're just worshiping the Lord Jesus. And so what a joy it's been for me to be here this morning. My wife was unable to come. She had some commitments at the church. So uh, happy to help Lance out by stepping in here this morning. He said, I have 35 minutes, so I guess I better get with it here and uh, make sure I, uh, I get uh, my time in here. You know, when you, take, you see a pastor take a watch off, uh, there's a story that goes with that. And uh, there were two little boys. They each attended different churches. And so uh, they would occasionally invite the other to join them as they would go to their church. And so uh, one Sunday, uh, the uh, little uh, boy from the Lutheran church went to the Baptist church, and he noticed that the pastor took his watch off and put it on the pulpit. And he turned to his friend and said, what does that mean? He said, absolutely nothing. (laughs) So I hope that's not the case this morning. So it's always interesting when you're asked to speak someplace else what you want to bring by way of a message. And so this morning uh, I'm bringing a message from the book of Revelation, but it has nothing to do with prophecy. And so uh, I'm going to, uh, I just need something to put this book on. So I'm just going to put that there. So what I'd like to do is just share with you some thoughts from one of the letters that was sent by the Lord Jesus to a real church in the first century, the church at Ephesus. And so that's what I'd like to do this morning. Let me pray. Father, we ask that you would just enable us to listen carefully to what you have to say. It's found in this book, and this book contains your words. And help me, Lord, as your servant to preach it, to teach it with clarity, with accuracy, and to get out of the way so that we just see you and we hear you. Lord, it's somewhat of a sobering letter. Uh, You commended a church, but you also took note of some of its failings. And I pray this morning as individuals, members of the church, the organism, the body of Christ, but also members of local churches, that we would listen carefully to what it is you might have for us this morning. So speak, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So several years ago, there was a uh, movement or a phenomenon. It was the WWJD, remember that? And it was based, I don't know if you realize this, the what would Jesus do thing was based actually on a book that was written in the late 19th century by a pastor. And the book was called In His Steps. And uh, this morning, just by way of a slight variation as I introduce my theme, um, instead of WW. What would Jesus do? I'd like to say this. What would Jesus ask? What would he ask this church? What questions would he have for you this morning? If the Lord Jesus could be here standing in this pulpit, what is it that he might ask you? I was thinking of the Apostle Peter because one day Peter on the shores of Galilee, post-resurrection, had Jesus look him straight in the eyes. Can you imagine that? Look, having Jesus look you straight in the eyes and ask this question, Peter, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these? Some interpretation there, some people think he was talking about the other disciples. Do you love me more than the rest of these guys? Because after all, Peter was the one who said, Lord, you know, everybody else may desert you, but you can count on me. And of course, we know how that story ended. But I don't think that's what he was talking about. I think he was saying to Peter, Peter, you've come back to your former life. You, you kind of quit on me and you've gone back to fishing. Do you love me more than the things that make you secure? Do you love me more than the things that make you comfortable? Do you love me more than the former life that you used to live? Do you love me more than the familiar? Than the things that used to satisfy you, that used to give you security? That's a pretty penetrating question, isn't it? And as we think of the church at Ephesus, Jesus could ask that church a question as well, and he kind of did, and we're going to look at that in just a moment. But the question might be, my dear saints in Ephesus, where did your early passion for me go? 
Where did your early passion for me go? This church had been around quite a few years. Paul planted it on one of his missionary journeys. And we know there was great depth there because you look at the book of Ephesians and you can, you can see there was significant spiritual depth in that church. But something had happened over the course of decades. It happens to all churches, local churches. And that's what I want to do this morning is look at what had happened at Ephesus and what the Lord's counsel and admonition was to this church. Seven letters in chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation. These are real letters uh, penned by John, but dictated by Jesus to real churches and real places. And we're going to look at the first one, church at Ephesus. So we're going to break it down into the introduction, the body of the letter, then the conclusion of the letter, if I get that far. Let's talk about the place where this church was located. He says, to the angel of the church in Ephesus. Ephesus was a city in what we know today to be Turkey. It doesn't exist anymore. When you go to Ephesus today, all you see are ruins. But at that time, it was commercially significant because it was the economic gateway to Asia Minor, which today is Turkey. So it was a significant gateway economically. It was a political significant place because it was the home of the Roman governor for that particular region. In addition to that, it was the home of one of the seven ancient wonders of the world, the Temple of Diana. And of course, Diana was a Roman fertility goddess. And the place was so bad. This is how bad it was. The moral climate in the city of Ephesus, because of the presence of the Temple of Diana, was so bad that a Greek philosopher said this. He said, you can't live in the city of Ephesus without weeping when you look at the rampant immorality. He was not a Christian. He was just observing how bad the city was. So it was a significant place religiously as well. About a city of 150,000 people. That's about as big as Santa Rosa. But it had 230 communities surrounding, surrounding it, or suburbs, if you will. That meant that it was a significant gateway for evangelism in the early church. So geographically, it was significant. And as I mentioned in Acts chapter 19, we discover it was planted by the Apostle Paul in one of his journeys. He spent about three years there. He had some pretty prominent members. Uh, Apollos, the guy who was called eloquent in the book of Acts, he was one of its pastors. Timothy, the guy to whom Peter wrote those two letters, First and Second Timothy, he was its pastor. And none other than the apostle John was its pastor for a while. Talk about, talk about a hall of fame of pastors. It had spiritual depth. But something had happened over the decades. Let me begin by looking at to whom he addresses the letter. This is kind of interesting. He calls him the angel of the church at Ephesus. And you go back up to the previous chapter to figure out who the angel of these churches is. The angel of the church is the lead pastor, the lead messenger. That's what angel means. It means messenger. So he addresses these letters, each and every one of them, to the leader amongst leaders of that local church to that lead elder, to that major messenger, the man to whom the words were given and the man who delivered those words to God's people. So this word is directed specifically to the pastor teacher of the church. He singles that individual out because he holds that individual accountable for the clear communication of the word of God to God's people in every local church. And he says to John, John, write what I'm about to dictate. He commands John to record it. Praise God, he did. And we're looking at it this morning. And then the identity of the author is none other than the Lord Jesus. And we know that as we look at the context here, the Lord Jesus. And there was a vision that John had back in chapter 1. And with this letter, Jesus goes back to the vision that John saw. And he pulls out a couple of things. And he wants John to see them in relationship to this church that he's writing to, the church at Ephesus. For instance, he says, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand. So that's Jesus, and he holds the seven stars, and each of those stars is the messenger, the major leader, elder, pastor, teacher of these churches. So he holds them in his hand, and it's a, it's a wonderful picture. It's an incredible picture of the Lord's sovereign protection of the leader of a local church and the Lord Jesus' authority over that leader. And it emphasizes his authority through human leadership in local churches. They stand there in his stead. They preach his message. They model Christ's likeness for the congregation. Heavy, heavy responsibilities are placed upon the shoulders of the leaders of the local church in the mind of Jesus. And he's addressing this to them. 
It's a picture of the Lord Jesus' relationship with his leaders. He holds them in his hand. But then he pictures his relationship with the church. Note what he says next. He walks among the seven golden lampstands. And the seven golden lampstands are these seven churches, Ephesus being one of them. Now, this is kind of a mind-boggling thought. Jesus is on patrol in every local church. First Baptist Church of Windsor, Jesus is on patrol here. Meaning he's observing. He's paying attention to what's going on. The church corporate and the individual lives that make the church corporate. And it's suggesting he's observing what's going on, what's transpiring in that local church. It also implies that he's also readily available for help to that local church. And so that's how he describes his relationship to the pastor and to the church. He says, the pastor is in my hand. I'm protecting him. Uh, He stands there in my place with my authority delegated to him. And in relationship to the church, I'm patrolling in the midst of it. I'm observing what's going on. Simple application. Knowing now that the Lord is on patrol in this church, as well as Santa Rosa Bible, and as a leader or as a member, or as an attender of that local church, you you have to ask yourself a question. What has he observed? And what message would he communicate to you as he communicated to Ephesus? What would he say? Well, let's look at the church at Ephesus because I think we can glean some insights for our own local churches by looking at what he had to say to the church at Ephesus. He begins with commendations. He begins with the positive. He begins with the good things that were present in the local church. This was a good church, but it wasn't a perfect church. No church is perfect. For those of you who think you're looking and you're going to find one day the perfect church, eh, you're not going to find it. No such church exists because we're all sinners saved by grace. This was not a perfect church though it was a good church. He approves more in this church than he condemns. And he begins with some positives, I think, to encourage them. So in verses 2 and 3 and 6, he says, I know stuff about you because I've been on patrol. I've been paying attention. I've observed, so I know stuff about you. He had observed this church. He had observed its service and ministry. He'd become aware of and understood some of its vital characteristics. He knew everything about it, both good and bad, which is pretty scary. So he begins with the good. And he says, listen, I know your deeds. This is her performance. He said, you're doers of the word. You're not just hearers. You're doers. And then he says, I know your toil. If I can stick with a P, I know your perspiration. Meaning, they worked hard in serving the Lord Jesus. And he took note of that. Thirdly, he says, I've taken note of your perseverance and that you've endured for my name's sake and you've not grown weary. This is her patient endurance in the face of opposition and persecution. He says to the church, you've hung tough. You have patiently remained under a load of affliction due to your identity with me. You haven't fainted. You haven't given up. You have staying power. And he said, I commend you for that. He says, I also take note of the fact you don't tolerate evil men. The idea being her purity. She did not passively put up with or make room for the rampant immorality which was in the city. The church would not permit it to creep into the church. They dealt with it. They called a spade a spade. They call out sin. They disciplined sin. And as a result of that, he commends them for doing that, keeping that local church pure. He goes on and says, I've taken note of the fact, too, that you test those who call themselves apostles. That's her discernment. She examined the claims of false spiritual leaders and teachers. She just didn't take things because someone who said they were a leader or they were a preacher or they were an apostle or they were a a representative of Jesus, she just didn't take it at its face value. She used the scriptures to discern whether or not this was error or truth. Praise God for churches like this who preach and teach the Bible using it to help discern the spirit of the age, to stand on the scriptures. This church did that. He commends her for that. He said, oh, by the way, I've also taken note of the fact that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. That's her conviction. And he said, I hate them as well. Who were the Nicolaitans? Well, these were people who 
professed Christianity and said they could kind of bring themselves to the brink of sinning because they had freedom in Christ to do so. And he said, you know exactly who they are. And he said, you have convictions and you will not allow your faith to be compromised as those men and women have compromised theirs. So the Ephesians worked hard. He esteemed, he noted that they esteemed right living high and right doctrine and they weren't quitters. So he commends them for all those good things to encourage them. But they weren't perfect. They weren't perfect. They didn't completely satisfy the Lord Jesus. So having commended them, then he moves into a condemnation of them. Verses 4 and 5, he says, but I have this against you. This is Jesus speaking to the church at Ephesus. I have this against you. In contrast to all the previous positives, he now strongly confronts them with who they were not and what they were not doing. They had left their first love and had fallen from their first deeds. Let me read it. He says, verse 4, but I have this against you that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Let's talk a little bit about what he means by this. Literally in the Greek, you have left your first love. It reads, your first love, you have left. The Greeks always move stuff up in the front end of the sentence when they wanted you to know if that's the really important stuff. So what did he want them to know? I have observed, as I've been on patrol in this local church, I have observed that you have deserted your initial love for me, for my people, and for the lost. And that is his first rebuke of them. They had deliberately, intentionally deserted, neglected, forsook how they loved in the beginning. He was holding them personally accountable for, we could call it an act of desertion. They had deserted Jesus, though there were all of these positives about them, a significant thing they had done, they had deserted their affection and their deep, deep love for Jesus, their passion for Jesus. What was this love that the Lord had in mind? What had changed? What was different? I think to understand the love that he's talking about here, that they had left, they had deserted, they had walked away from, you have to go to the Gospel of John. The guy who wrote the book of Revelation was the Apostle John, and he wrote the Gospel of John, and he recorded for us Jesus' final thoughts about love. And the thing you discover as you look into the Gospel of John is that the Lord called his people to love three different ways. We could put it this way. He talked about an upward love. He talked about an inward love. And he talked about an outward love. First of all, when it comes to this upward love, John chapter 14, no less than three times in verse 15, 21, as well as 23, he says, if you love me, you will. How's that verse end? You will keep my commandments. In the mind of Jesus, love is equated with obedience. I'm a parent. I'm a grandparent. And when I raised my children and as I impact my grandkids, nothing brings me more delight than them doing what I ask them to do. Uh, My grandson is very independent, has a mind of his own, has a tremendous amount of energy. He's eight years old. And I have to learn to be patient with him because as a grandfather, I expect when I say something, I expect it to be heated like yesterday. And that is not the case with Henry. Or when he comes and he asks for something, he doesn't ask once, he doesn't ask twice, he doesn't ask three times, he asks like an infinite number of times over and over and over. And you have to be patient. There's no greater way to manifest love and affection for someone who cares for you than to do what they ask of you. Jesus says, I want you to have this deep affection for me. I want you to have a deep, deep relationship with me. And it has nothing to do with getting more religiously active. It has everything to do with just doing what I ask you to do. Because I love you and I'm looking out for your best interests. And I 
give you commands because I'm trying to protect you. I'm trying to nurture this deep and abiding relationship with me. And what he's saying to the Ephesian Christians is, you've deserted that. It's all about religious activity. It isn't about nurturing this intimacy with the Lord Jesus. It's not about passion for the Lord Jesus. But then he also talked about an inward love. In John 13, 34 and 35, he said, By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. One another. It's a love that focuses on our brothers and sisters in Christ. It's a deep devotion to each other and sacrificially meeting one another's needs on every level. And it doesn't focus on programs and buildings. It focuses on body life. It focuses on how we relate to one another. You know, shame on us as the body of Christ, as people look into our world and they see us behave just like they behave towards one another. We don't forgive one another. We gossip about one another. When we're told to love one another, to be deeply affectionate towards one another, to forgive one another. And yet we behave like the world. So why would they want what we have? Because we don't have anything any different. As far as they're concerned, Jesus is telling us this kind of intimacy is to exist in the body of Christ. And praise God, in many cases, it does. I just heard some testimonies about two weeks ago and, and how there was this deep affection and connection with one another because your brothers and sisters in Christ in a local church and other local churches were there supporting and encouraging you. That's the way it ought to be. And Jesus said, when people see that, They'll know that you're my followers because they can see my love working in you as you care for one another. As a matter of fact, Jesus challenged them to live and serve one another in a risky and sacrificial way. Most of us are prepared to kind of love up to a certain level, right? Just as long as we don't have to give too much, too much time, too much money, whatever. But Jesus said, no greater love has any man than this that he do what? Lay down his life for another. You want to demonstrate your love for each other deeply? Then give whatever it is you have to help alleviate that need in that brother or sister's life. And you do it without even thinking about it. It's just a reflex response. Outward love is the third kind of love. There's the upward love that had faded, their love for the Lord Jesus. There was this inward love that had diminished their love and care and affection for each other. But then there was this outward love. And of course, in John 20, 21, he said, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. And in John 3, 16, we know what motivated the Father to send Jesus. What was it? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that he sent his son. It was love. And so I think Jesus is also condemning the fact that they had lost a love and affection for lost people. And yet, he says, I've dispatched you here on earth to be my ambassador. 2 Corinthians 5, where his ambassadors, his representatives, we might be the only contact with the sinful world that a sinner may have because we're their neighbor or we work with them or we go to school with them or we happen to be in the same family. He says, you're my ambassadors. And in that same passage, 2 Corinthians 5, he said that the love of Christ should what? Compel you to love sinners. To what extent? In 2 Corinthians 5, he says, begging people who are lost to be reconciled with God. Does that characterize our affection for the lost of the world that cross our path every day? And I'm speaking to myself here. It's easy to stand in a pulpit like this and preach the gospel. It's easy to be at a memorial service or a wedding or some other event where there's an expectation that, oh yeah, he's the pastor of the Bible church, so we're going to hear about this gospel stuff. It's a little different when I talk to my neighbor. Have you discovered that? Or it's a little different when I try to talk to that loved one of mine, my sister or my brother, my parent, and yet we are called to this outward love. Our hearts need to break over lost people, hell-bound world. The Lord has to change their hearts through the preaching of the gospel. You don't change society. You preach the gospel. He changes a heart. He changes a life. 
And that's what changed the society. Well, this church had lost their fervor in all of those areas. Listen, listen to the heart of some past and present Christians who have articulated this passion for lost people. C.T. Studd, you don't know who that is. He was a missionary. He had a promising athletic career. He gave it up so that he could become a missionary. And he was a, he was a poet of someone. And he said this, and I quote, Some want to live within the sound of a church or a chapel bell. I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. That was his heart. I don't know who this guy is, but I like what he says. He's, he's a contemporary of ours. His name is Nick Vujicic. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but I like what he said, and I quote him. He said, I'm an ambassador of Jesus Christ standing at the gates of hell redirecting traffic. I like that. But the one that always gets me is Spurgeon, and I quote, if sinners will be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our bodies. And if they will perish, let them perish with our arms about their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, at least let it be filled in the teeth of our exertion, and let not one go there unwarned and unprayed for. Unquote. Well, that's just way too convicting. See, by God's grace, me. He gave each of us this kind of heart for our lost family and friends. And that's why he exhorted this church the way that he did. In spite of all these promising characteristics, he said, when he gets right down to it, you have just kind of lost the heart of it all. Your deep affection for me, your deep love and affection for one another, and your deep affection for those who are lost and hopeless. There's more in this text we could look at, but I'm going to stop there. I think that's enough for us to kind of meditate on, think about. And I guess I would just leave you with this thought. If Jesus this morning was here, and one by one he asked you to come and sit with him, and he looked you right in the eyes, and he said to you what he said to Peter, do you love me more? than these, whatever these might be, your past life, your present life, your stuff, whatever. In the end, Jesus was saying to the church at Ephesus, I loved you so much I died for you. That's how much I loved you. You were worth it. The father said, you're, you're worth my son. So you, as you sit here this morning, how would you answer that question? Do you love me more than these? Father, I pray for each one of us that we'd give some serious thought, consideration to the words of Jesus as he wrote to the church at Ephesus. He recognized her, her positives. She had wonderful characteristics. And yet, somewhere along the way, she had deserted this great affection for the Lord Jesus. Somewhere along the way, her affection for one another had waned, and somewhere along the way, she just had lost that passion to take the gospel to a world that was desperately lost and hopeless and in need of Christ. And Lord, may there be a lesson there for us. May we take time to do some self-evaluation, some, some introspection as we would look at our own hearts. And might we be able to, using this upward love, this inner love, and this outward love idea to ask ourselves, how would I answer? Have I somehow walked away and deserted that initial passion that was there when I first became a Christian? That initial passion as a church, when the church was first planted, that excitement of knowing you and wanting others to know you. Lord, bless this work. Bless these leaders. Bless this ministry. And even using these circumstances of the past few weeks, might they be able to enter into a number of relationships and point people to the only hope there is, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.